and welcome back to another episode of the 2020 podcast, bringing clarity to optometry, business, and entrepreneurship. I am your host, Dr. Harbir Sayan. Thank you so much, guys, for taking the time to join me here to learn and to grow. As always, truly, truly appreciate all the support. Appreciate everything everyone has done to share the podcast and help it grow. And as always, I ask this one favor right off the top, which is if you could, if you do find any value from this episode or any other episode, please, if you could just share it with someone else who you think could get value from it, take a screenshot, throw it up on your Instagram story, hit like, hit subscribe, leave a comment, leave a review, all of those things, any of those things, whichever one is easiest for you, please go ahead and do that. And talking about bringing value, you know, I'm always trying to bring on guests who are going to help us be better in some capacity, in some form, some way we can learn from their experience to grow in our own life and experience. And man, today's guest takes the cake in all of those categories. Like I love all my guests and I've had some pretty special people on the podcast. I've been very blessed. But today's guest for this episode is literally the greatest at what she does, literally. And you know, it's hard to say that when somebody is really, really, really good at their job or really good at their profession or whatever they do, it's really hard to say that you are the single greatest person in the entire world at what you do. That is something special. And that person is Dr. Haley Wickenheiser. So if you haven't heard of Haley Wickenheiser before, that's fine. It's understandable. But I know that there's a lot of Canadians out there who have heard of her. She is a seven-time world champion, and she is a four-time Olympic gold medalist with the Canadian women's national team. And she was the captain on most of those teams. She was the MVP twice at the Olympics, just at a whole different level when it comes to her sport. But to go beyond that, after her career in hockey, Dr. Haley Wickenheiser, as you can tell from her title, completed her medical degree and is now in the process of completing her residency as a medical doctor. After many years of playing hockey, she has moved on to this new phase of her life and is no doubt succeeding and crushing it in this capacity as well. All of this over the background of the pandemic over the last couple of years, she's continued to grow and succeed in that. And she wrote a book called Over the Boards, lessons from the ice. And that was the impetus for, for me reaching out to her. I'm already very familiar with Dr. Wickenheiser from her years as a hockey player. But when I saw this book, I just had to read it. And man, I'm so glad I did because the lessons that come out of this book are applicable to basically anyone and everyone, no matter what industry you're in, what profession you're in. She goes from talking about motherhood. She talks about her challenges early on in her career as a child, six, seven, eight years old, playing on the rink in the backyard, being told that she can't play with boys to having a change in sleep in boiler rooms and closets when she goes on trips for tournaments to becoming, of course, the greatest in the world. So just unbelievable to have her on the podcast, unbelievable to listen to her share these insights about the ups and the downs, the struggles, the gender bias, the grit and the resilience that it takes to get to where she is now. So I hope that everyone listening is able to take at least small pieces of insight from this and apply them to your lives right away. I know that I have and will just from reading the book and after speaking to her, I will for sure. Let me know what you think. As always, I'm really excited to hear everyone's feedback on this one. Shoot me a DM on Instagram, send me an email, whatever you like. I'd love to hear back from you. But here it is. Finally, here's the episode with Dr. Haley Wickenheiser, guys. Talk to you soon. Dr. Haley Wickenheiser, thank you so very much for joining me on the 2020 podcast. I am truly, truly so grateful. Oh, thanks for having me, Herbert. It's great to be here with you. It's absolutely my pleasure. I can only imagine how busy you are these days with everything you've got going on. So I'm really grateful about that. You know, it's interesting. I had a guest on a while back who I said that to. I'm like, oh, you must be so busy. And she said, I don't like using the word busy because it, I don't know, I guess it's got a bit of a negative connotation to it. She said, my life is full. And I said, that sounds better. That sounds better. So could you, if you wouldn't mind, yeah. Dr. Wickenheiser, what types of things is your life full with these days? <laughs> well, I like that too. I mean, yes, I am very busy, but it's always a choice. And I guess a little bit less when you're doing residency and medicine, but your right. life is not fully your own. But between, I'm in a, a family med residency program here in Toronto, as well as my, my work that I do with the Toronto Wave Maple Leafs. That is basically two full-time jobs on top of each other. But I've been able to manage both. The pandemic has thrown lots of twists and turns into all of our lives. And so in some ways, it's been a blessing with a lot of virtual learning and 
less commuting. And then in other ways, it's been a nightmare load for everyone just in yeah. terms of not being able to travel. I'm a big, uh, I've just spent my whole life on the road traveling. So this has been a bit of a weird couple of years here, not traveling, but in some ways it's been good as well. So between those two sort of jobs, it's been a full-time gig. Yeah. Like you said, two full-time jobs. And I mean, what I've heard about residency is more than one full-time job <laughs> residency on its own. <laughs> yeah. And in there somewhere, you managed to also write a book which I have here with me. I'll make sure I show this wherever I can on uh, video or social media, but Over the Boards, Lessons from the Ice, which was my impetus to reach out to you because this was really such a great book. But can you tell me where you found the time to do that? I was asked to do this book and I did one in 2010. It was called Life in uh, Bull Metal Diary. And it was really about what goes on inside the Olympic Village the Games. And so then I was asked to do a second one. And this one, I thought I would divide up into almost like three periods and then offensive zone, defensive zone and neutral zone and the game of hockey. And I started it just before the pandemic hit. And then about three months into the pandemic, I actually had it finished because we had a little bit of downtime there at the start when right. NHL was canceled and there was residents were pulled out of rotations. And so life was just a bit of a lull. So I was able to do it. And the way I wrote it was by driving. So I'd talk into my phone and then uh, we would put it out, type it out. I had Nancy McDonald in Vancouver kind of uh, put it into a bit of a um, structure and then we worked through it. She did a fantastic job that way and I was able to get all of sort of my language down on paper and my thoughts and I think a little better than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> That's but it's, nice. uh, it was, it's a process. There are a lot of work, boy, I tell you. Oh, I can only imagine anybody I've spoken to who's written a book says it's one of the most difficult, challenging, time-consuming things I've ever done. So kudos to yeah. you. Going back to your work, I was telling my wife as I was going through your book, I'd always like, can you believe she did this as well? And one of the things is, you know, I have friends and family who are medical doctors and I've heard how grueling that whole process can be, whether it's the first few years while you're in school or clinical stuff, residency stuff. And here you are with a full-time job working with the Toronto Maple Leafs, a professional <laughs> National Hockey League, you know, hockey team at the same time is mind-blowing to me. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, I know you mentioned in your book, efficiency is one of the keys to kind of getting a lot of stuff done. Can you share a little bit of some secrets around efficiency, like what you might be doing to be efficient? I've done this my whole life as an athlete where you, you know, I had to really be a good time manager. I had a young child at the age of 21. So managing being a young mama and then traveling the world and being an athlete and I'm very internally driven. So a little bit of that A-type personality to want to prepare and be the best that basically everything that I'm doing. And I think what I realized at a young age is the first thing is you've got to cut out things that aren't important or are not serving your purpose. So I don't spend a lot of extraneous wasting time. I guess I'm just not a time waster. I kind of believe that every minute matters. I like to usually prepare like, not like to prepare looking down the road, but day before in advance, I'll usually sort of prepare my day. And then when I was training and competing, it was very militaristic in terms of every minute kind of plotted out. And mm. it is a bit the same now with residency and the lease schedule, because there's just so much that has to get done and we need to stay on top of. So I like to prep that way. And then I think efficiency also comes when you're rested. So I really believe in getting sleep. Like I really try to get eight hours a night if I can, <laughs> minimum. And that's definitely not always possible in residency, but I've become a good napper through the years being an athlete. So I can power nap if I have to for 20 minutes and usually come alive. And then the last thing is, I think, just like physical fitness too. Like I train every day and try to not let that fall by the wayside. Because I think if you can't take care of yourself, you really can't do anything else very well if you're not feeling good. So those things, I think, contribute to efficiency and then just prioritizing things and not uh, checking in where you're maybe wasting time. Right? But then having days too, where you can just Netflix and do nothing, which I also do. <laughs> That's great. You know, I also just try to carve out leisure time. I think people think that I just work 24 seven, but I do work extremely hard. But then I also like rest really hard too, and just chill out and just shut off the phone and take breaks and things like that at times as well. Probably not as often as I should, but I think that's really important also. That's so good to hear. And, and I mean this in the most positive way possible, but you do come across as like a machine. You're driven, yeah. you do things efficiently, you are incredibly successful, obviously, but it's nice to hear there's that aspect to your life as well, where you are human and you need to rest and you need to recover and have that alone time. 
when there's a chapter in your book, rest is a weapon. I love that. And I think that's so key because we live in also a culture where it's kind of like hustle culture, right? You got to work hard, yeah. grind 24 seven, sleep is for yeah. the dead, <laughs> all this kind of thing. And I'm a little more like you where I feel like I need that seven, eight hours every night to really function well. And now if I meet someone who's like, oh, I only sleep four hours, well, I'll say, well, you know what? Haley Wickenheiser sleeps eight, so I'm good. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yes. No, I'm with you. I think that this whole culture of more is better is not necessarily efficient, nor wise, nor productive. And I don't think people do their best work. And it really hit me between the eyes in residency when I'm on hour 24 of 26, and I've had 20 minutes of sleep and went to the bathroom once and I maybe ate like an apple at 10 in the morning. Oh my God. And I'm just like, this is crazy town. Like nobody can be at their best doing this. So it really forced me to like have strategies to survive those shifts in this time period in residency where I know I have to grind it out for another <laughs> 18 to 28 months to get through it all. But in the end, the payoff for the rest of my life is going to be freedom and wings that I've gotten through this profession. So it's a trade-off sometimes where, mm. yes, it is a grind, but you have to, I think, always have that lull or that pause to get to the downside of it, or you'll just hate it and burn out. Yeah, absolutely. Burnout definitely with the pandemic has been a big topic as well. So I think, like you said, take care of yourself. Everybody out there who may be working real hard these days, make sure you do get that rest so you can continue mm -hmm. to succeed. I think you've already touched on some of this already, but one thing I've found when I've spoken to high-level athletes, now you are the highest level athlete I've spoken to, which is probably not a surprise, but mm -hmm. in other sports, whether it's hockey or basketball or, or whatever, I find if they're successful or a high level, high achiever in their sport or athletics in general, they're able to transfer something from that, from sport, from athletics to whether it's business, education, medicine, whatever it is. And obviously that's the case for you now, having been so successful in your hockey career and then being able to almost seamlessly transition to becoming a medical doctor business owner, working with the Leafs, all these things. Are there specific things that you can put your finger on that <clears throat> transferred from athletics to non-athletic world? It's a great question. And I would say that probably there are a lot. I tell people every day in medicine that every single thing that I did in sport, I use every day in medicine, you know, discipline, teamwork, preparation. I think one of the reasons that athletes become very good in other lives is because your whole life, you get told everything you're doing wrong. And so you, <laughs> on the daily basis, get used to absorbing criticism, dealing with it and letting it propel you forward versus crush you. And I've seen in residency for sure, maybe younger medical students that don't have the life experience that I have when you do get criticism, which you always do and feedback on things you're doing wrong because you're constantly failing forward that people can get really demoralized. And so one of the things I think athletes do well is they don't let it demoralize them and they just keep going. They have this like, I will make it mentality because that's what you have to do in sport. It's such a dog eat dog world. So I think there's that. I think there is an incredible level of commitment, preparation and discipline that goes into being the best in the world or at the top of your sport that many people just never experience in life. And be pushing your body to the limits that it can go to playing and living day to day through fatigue and injuries and actual physical, mental, emotional pain. I think that that hardens people, makes people resilient. So athletes tend to be uh, very good at those types of qualities and then bring them into the business world. And then I also will say for a female athlete, you know, one of the things that I think female male sport, especially pro sport can learn from female sport is a lot of these guys make a lot of money. And so when they retire, they don't have a life plan for life after. Whereas most every female athlete is thinking about life after because you're just not set up financially to just set off into the, just hit the beach and call it a day. And I think that's a healthy thing because a lot of these guys, they end up struggling with no purpose and no direction. And all of a sudden the day is done and there's no 20 other players or whatever to go and hang out with. So these things are real. And I was the last player on the national team to get my university degree. And I was in my late thirties. Most of my other teammates already had one. They have MBAs and all sorts of things. So very educated and good discipline along the way. There's so many points that you touched on throughout the book, really such amazing themes and topics that you touched on. I know we won't be able to get to all of them, but one of them was you're pretty direct about some certain things, which I like a lot, you know, and you're upfront about it. Some of these struggles that players do face whether you talk about in male sports, some of the guys who struggle with mental illness or whether it's substance abuse and things like that is really not talked about very much. It's just so important to bring that to the forefront so people understand, you know, we look at these, we put these athletes 
like yourself as well, but athletes on a pedestal and just assume that they're all good. Everything's fine because you're a successful athlete, but there's so much more happening there. So thank you for sharing those types of things in there as well. And then for yourself also, just, I felt you were quite vulnerable throughout the book, which I imagine is not something that you were necessarily good at just based on, you know, the other things you talk about yourself as being sort of the type of athlete you were, which I think Mm -hmm. is so key. Cause again, for somebody else, even just like myself, looking at an athlete, you assume that people are just, they got this shield around them. They're protected. They don't let things get to them. They don't let things bother them, but obviously that's not true. And, you know, one of the quotes that you have in there sort of kind of pivot a little bit from that. I think it was from the 2010 Olympics, the the pressure is a privilege. Is that, I think when you were referencing that quote from Billie Jean King, I love that. And I think it's easy for anybody, even in day-to-day life to get caught up under pressure, but we have to look at that as pressure as a privilege. Could you, if you wouldn't mind sort of elaborating on that quote and where you came across it? Yeah. Well, I think like to go back to the vulnerability piece too, which ties in and just for sure, like as an athlete, as a captain, as a leader, I think early on, it was like, okay, must have it all together. Can't let your guard down, can never show anybody that you're struggling. And then I learned through the years and maturity and just being around long enough that sometimes the best effective form of leadership is to actually, to show that vulnerability, to humanize yourself with the people that you work with, because you're more relatable that way. And so I think that was something that for me didn't come naturally, but I think made me a better leader. And then when it comes to pressure is a privilege. I mean, in the Vancouver Olympics in 2010, the entire media of Canada kept saying to us, you know, are you guys going to choke? It's the Olympics in your home country. Can you get the job done? These types of back and forth. And so we just decided that it's not the weight of a nation pushing us down, wanting us to fail. It's the weight of the nation pushing us from behind 37 million people, like the seventh man in the stand. So we were going to flip the narrative on its head and pressure would be a privilege. And I really use that mantra a lot in every aspect of my life when I'm kind of quietly whining to myself or complaining (laughs) about how much I don't like residency at spots. I check myself sometimes and say, hey, like people would people would die to have this position that you're in and have this opportunity. So get over yourself kind of thing. First world problem here. And remind myself, like, but we all do it, like it's normal and we all have our own struggles and perspective is doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or what your status is. We all struggle. So I yeah. think it's just sometimes it's the way to reframe it. And it's also a way when I do feel like the weight of the world or there is a lot of pressure to do something. Hey, you know, I'm not alone. I've got a team here. There's other people that are capable and just deflecting. And in a team sport, you learn to deflect pressure a lot because you can. I don't know how those like single tennis players feel <laughs> when they're on the court by themselves. They don't have too many places to deflect the pressure, but I certainly used it as a tactic to survive those moments. That's really great to hear that. And then yeah, you're right. I think sports like golf or tennis, that could get tough. You're just out there all by yourself. No one to sort of like lean on or, or delegate to. That could get challenging. Um, I think so. It's got to be a lonely place at times. <laughs> no, yeah, no kidding. Well, you could see that why certain tennis players kind of explode on the court, I think sometimes, right? Yeah, for sure. One topic, I think we've touched on this briefly a bit, but I think you start the book with this and it's just something that stays in my mind a lot in general is grit and resilience. You kind of make a distinction between those two terms. I imagine that's a key skill or quality for an athlete to succeed, but also in the business world and medicine, all these things just to get through school, to get through your day-to-day business, to get through the downtimes. If you wouldn't mind first distinguishing the difference, what you see between grit and resilience, and then can those things be built or is it something that's innate and you're born with? Yeah. So I think grit is just the ability to get up every day and do hard things and get through hard times, sort of to work, to really work and persevere through whatever's difficult, you know, assignments you don't like in school, a project at work that you don't like, dealing with people that you don't get along with, just finding ways to get the job done, really. And then I think resiliency is built over time where you accumulate this grit by working through difficult things. And then you sort of gather this internal confidence that, hey, there's no task that's too tough for me to get through and I can do this. So that resiliency, I think, is built over time. And and I think for athletes who are in the sport world, the best athletes that I've ever been around are the most resilient. They are the ones that can sort of get knocked down, whether it's injury, slumps, poor play, coaches' decisions, and get back up and keep going and find a way. Like, they are the most solution-based people that I know. And, you know, the glass is generally half full. And I think that that develops a lot of resiliency and a lot of fortitude. And then when you get into a bind in a really tough pressure situation, you can always go back to the well knowing, hey, look, I did this work. I'm prepared. There's no one 
more ready than I am. And so I really hung my hat for my career on work ethic and preparation. And I always felt like someone could be more talented than me. There's not much I could control about that, but no one's going to outwork me. And that's what I'm going to hold on to. And that's where I'll have my own control. And that's where the resiliency came in. And it's something that you can build. You can train yourself to be more gritty and build that resiliency. Because I feel like that's an important message. Sometimes it's easy for some to look around and say, well, that person's got this, whatever quality it might be that's making them more successful than I. But like you said, you can work on it. As long as you're working hard, you should be able to build that as well. So I think that's really important. I agree. The last kind of big topic I wanted to touch on was gender bias. And it's a big topic. We probably spend the entire podcast talking about this one thing, but there's no doubt that you face your challenges as a young person, as a young girl coming up in a sport that was male dominant, you know, whether it was not getting playing time, having to change in closets and boiler rooms and sleep in those spaces because there's no space for girls in these facilities. How about when you were older? Is you're becoming more kind of as a well-known person or more successful hockey player? If you're comfortable sharing certain scenarios, please do. But is this something that you face all the way through your career? And even now in medicine, do you feel that you face these types of things as well? Yeah, I mean, it is something that I faced my whole career. Probably was harder until I was midway through my national team career because there's a few things that changed. I mean, I felt when I was younger, I needed to constantly prove myself that every time I stepped on the ice, somebody, I wanted people to say, you know, that's a hockey player, not a female hockey player. That's a good Mm -hmm. hockey player and leave impressed. And then as I got older, I kind of like dropped that because that's an exhausting way to live is just trying to prove something to someone every single day. But then when I got, I think, at the end of my career and moving in through medicine and into my role with the Leafs, I really sort of have settled into this place where I feel very comfortable that at any given time, in any given situation, I can hold my own with anyone. And so I don't really feel like I experience that. I know it exists and it's out there. And I definitely feel that you're constantly having to, maybe as a female, prove yourself, work harder or give it right back when it's dished out. There's this dynamic that does exist, especially in a male-dominated world like hockey, maybe not so much in medicine because it's a little bit more male-female dominant. Mm -hmm. But certainly the hockey world is still stuck sometimes back in 1972 Mm -hmm. and it's a challenge. But I just feel like for myself internally, I feel different about it today than I did when I was younger. Yeah. And would you be able to then share your thoughts with a young person, a young lady who may be coming up, whether sports or medicine or business, Lessons that you've learned there that maybe helps them come through these potential challenges as well? Yeah, I think you got to have thick skin. Like, I think we can never control what other people are going to say or do or how they're going to react. When I was a little girl, my parents, they really shielded me from a lot of this negative narrative and they supported me, my parents did. But I think there's no easy way. Like, if you want to do things that are unorthodox and maybe not sort of female, (laughs) male dominated, you have to be willing to walk through some uncomfortable positions. And I always tell like young women, like when it's dished out, don't be afraid to give it right back again (laughs) and to persevere and to have that belief in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself and you're not going to be your own best friend at times, nobody else is going to do it. And so it's not comfortable. It's not easy. I think that's the thing that I would tell young girls. It's not easy. It's getting easier, but it's like anything, work ethic, your passion, your preparation. And I think in today's world, people are more open-minded to give young girls and women in unorthodox, typically male positions, give them opportunities to have a chance. But you got to be prepared to walk through that door when it happens. You may only get one shot. Yeah. Unfortunately, that there's somewhat like those limitations for females to kind of have the pressure of having to take that shot when it gets there or kind of having to stand up or push back or whatever, all those things. But it's nice to have a role model like yourself to show that it can be done. And of course, Thanks to people like yourself, there's more and more opportunities for young girls who are coming up now. So thank you for everything that you've done. From a father of two little girls, I appreciate that for creating these (laughs) opportunities for them in the future. No problem. Uh, Yeah, no, it's getting easier. I think for a young girl, a little girl, a little five-year-old girl growing up today is a lot different than when I was the little five-year-old girl. It'll be professional women's hockey someday for her. Mm. She'll be able to have a full paying job in hockey in any role that she probably chooses. Um, you know, it's just so different. It's come a long way. It still is a long yeah. way to go, but there is progress. And I choose to focus on the things that have been good and progress and what we don't have. Because again, I believe in solutions, not problems. Yeah. It's nice to focus on that side of things for sure. And yes, of course, you've briefly met one of them, one of my daughters via social media there. And it's because of there's a book that she has. It's called a five minute stories for fearless girls. And 
you're in the book. Yeah. It's a bunch of stories here of successful women throughout history who've done things to change history and you're in it. So it's really cool that I could tell her about you in that book. And then of course, learn about you myself in your book, which once again is called Over the Boards, Lessons from the Ice. Before we wrap up, I usually have two final questions to ask every guest. Before we do that, where can people find you, find your book and, you know, just learn more about you? Sure. So I have a website, HaleyWickenheiser.com. You can find me on Twitter at, at Wick underscore 22 and then Instagram at HChickWick. And then I have a website under my name as well, a public website. So Wickfest.com is my hockey festival for young girls between the ages of 6 and 18 that we host every year in Surrey, Calgary, and possibly Toronto if we can ever get through this pandemic. Mm. And yeah, if people want to pick up the book, there are uh, chapters Indigo, Amazon, wherever you buy your books. So no, I appreciate the time, Harbier, and it's uh, great to chat with you. And thanks for having me on today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm not going to let you go just yet because I have two okay. final questions that I like okay. to ask every okay. guest. And I want to quickly pose those to you now. So the first one is, if we could hop in a time machine and go back to a point in time where you were struggling, something was happening that was quite difficult. Now, you please feel free to share that moment if you're comfortable. But more importantly, what is the advice that you would give to yourself in that moment? I just had a really bad foot injury at the end of the last Olympics that I played in in Sochi. I had to get surgery and I was non-weight bearing for mm. four months. Didn't know if I'd play again, which I ended up playing a couple more years. But I think first thing I'd say is don't panic. <laughs> you have a good plan. You have good supports around you and start from the end and work backwards. Create from where you want to be and then start working from there and then take it every day, one day at a time. That start from the end and work backwards, that's a really great way of thinking. I feel like I think I've heard something somewhat similar from Jeff Bezos. So it seems like you're in good ah. company with that thought. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah. The last question, which I honestly, I feel kind of silly asking you this because I think it's fairly clear from learning about you. But like I said, I ask every guest, everything you've achieved, world championships, Olympic gold medals, Hockey Hall of Fame, now you're a doctor. How much of this would you say is due to luck? How much is due to hard work? I would say <laughs> I would say 90% hard work and 10% right place, right time. Probably being at the start when I was a little girl, having just social supports, the, the right environment to grow up in, fortunate social, economic, middle class Canada kind of thing, and had a lot of opportunity that way. But then I think I took it and ran with it. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Now I will let you go. Thank you so much, Dr. Wickenheiser, for the time, okay. for everything you've done, for hockey, for people in Canada for my little girls. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's great to talk to you. Appreciate thank you. It. And thank you to everybody who's tuned in to listen. Again, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and check out Dr. Haley Wickenheiser's book. It's so good. Over the Boards, Lessons from the Ice. And I'll be back with you guys again in the next episode. Take care.